It's better to have two recordings because you never know what happens. Yeah, welcome back today. It's a wonderful spring day here in Italy. I, I would actually like to be outside, but I prefer to stay with you in here. I was listening to this um, video summit, um, the whole three days or four days, Dharma and the evolution of conflict. I really recommend it to you. The uh, replays are still one or two days um, for free, and there was very good stuff there. Really, oh, it has much to do with um, Aikido. Most of many of these people are Aikido and integral practitioners, and it's so interesting to see it from a different perspective. But there was also Ken and Terry Patton and Jeff Salzman, and afterwards. At five o'clock our time will be Ben Seganti, who is the organizer of the European Integral um, Conferences. Really good work he's doing. And I, I recommend to you, come next year to Hungary, to the conference. S save the money for that. It's not extremely expensive, but when you come from America, it's, you know, the flight and everything. But really, really good. This is an integral experience and not like I have seen the uh, integral conferences in America which are not very integral this is people speaking and others listening and every now and then is some interconnection while in Hungary that's part of it like this but the other half is really experiential and very 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 engaging so I just uh, give you this introduction. I saw there is a new person, Tim, and some other people had uh, said they would maybe come. So in our list are now, I think, 14 people, 15 people. So really happy. And in the future, we will see when we are too many to, to talk together, then we will separate into, into groups, keeping it recorded because we need to, to know what the others have said. And then there's Damiano again. Thank you, Damiano. Uh, I sent you the questions regarding the platform. You know, I, I, it's really a good platform, but we, we still have to, to get used to it and to, to use it because I think it's so much better than Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today is the, what, what date is today? 24th. 24th of March, thank you. And we today want to talk about the blue level. Last time we talked about purple, but we had taken red before. So if you want to, to watch what we thought about red, you can uh, go on the, on the website, uh, thewisdomfactory.net, and then you find under integral chat, you find all the recordings. And I think today, blue. And before we start, I would like you to give a, a short check-in, not necessarily already for the topic, but just how, how are you here today? And then from there, we, we start into the topic, okay? I said I'm really good. It's nice, finally warmer. And, <laughs> and I enjoy to be in nature, but I enjoy also very much to be with you. Well, we're, we're having a heat wave here in New Hampshire. It was um, 30 degrees. Had a great walk with my dog and all that. Then went out for breakfast with my roommate. And he and I are both having um, grief of loss, of knowing, not knowing how to connect with a couple of friends who are at blue level. And so um, I'm very glad to be here today <laughs> to see if I can learn how to be more effective with um, those that are at this level. <laughs> Well, I'm, a, I'm going to be a bit scattered today. <clears throat> One of my two brothers died uh, a couple weeks ago, very suddenly and unexpectedly. And we're having the ceremony tomorrow. So the family is converging. And the next today and tomorrow and the day after are going to be a lot of uh, surging family intense dealing with it all together. So I'm just going to kind of float in my raft along with the ride today and uh, take it as it comes. 
my name is Tim. I'm new to, I guess, thanks. Um, I'm new to Integral, um, and uh, I'm really interested to hear what this forum is like, so I'll be doing a lot of listening today. I may not be doing that much talking. Okay, welcome, Tim. It would be nice if you showed us your face, you know. It's nicer to see somebody behind the voice, if you sure. I'm right. I'm right next to Natalie. Can you see me next to Natalie? Then? Ah, that's you. Okay. <laughs> good, 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 good. You, so you can also speak together from, from that place, so you don't have to spend money for the telephone. <laughs> sort of. I have a microphone issue, so it's okay. a little bit easier right now. Great. Thank you. Um, we're here on the Oregon I'm a little bit groggy, but really happy to be here, really enjoying the, the sunrise on, on the ocean and um, talking with um, people at blue level has been um, something that's been pretty important to me, especially because my father is very much uh, Christian, uh, Catholic oriented. And so um, he's also been available and interested in um, talking about integral with me and doesn't really quite understand it, but um, I feel like I've gained a lot of insight about some of the dynamics through relationship with them. Just a question, Natalie. It's very low, your volume, to me at least. I don't know if to the others too. So when, um, I don't know if you speak together in the, in the main microphone of the computer, is that working better? I don't know. Hi, Kate. Hi, Kate. We're at a beach house, and so there's some people who are sleeping still on the couches, and my hair is quite crazy, and it's one of those weekends we're just here to enjoy. Um, but is that any better? It is? Yes. It's okay. better. Okay. Thank you. We cannot hear you. There must be something with your mic. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, it's a kind of rarely sunny day here in England. Um, I was sunbathing naked for a few hours before I got on, and it's kind of um, it's kind of fun being like energetically attuned. Like I've I learned that like vitamin D these days is almost treated like a hormone, so I can kind of. I can just feel it like jazzed in my in my body, which is fun. Um, and I kind of want to say, like, it's funny how much these calls impact me. Like when we were talking about beige, I had a massive beige week, and um, this week I had a huge purple one. Like being really aware of like group dynamics, bringing it up in this kind of very green circling community that, um, that I was on, and kind of um, having lots of break breakthroughs. So kind of enjoying like just how much it colors the entire rest of my week. Well, um, hi everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm actually so really ecstatic because I just completed a 45 hour training in mediation and conflict management with the city of uh, Portland. And it was absolutely life changing. It was probably the best experience of my life, like training or workshop experience. And um, very, very relevant to integral theory. And I'll, I'll just share a quick story as it relates to blue and amber. So, so not to brag about myself, but maybe a little bit. Um, a lot of my a lot of my classmates and, and coaches were kind of saying like, you know, like I was doing really well in the class and and kind of like doing the best in the class. And I really think it's it's the integral theory background kind of gave me an advantage, and in two specific ways. So, the first one was um, the mediation field in Portland is very dominated by green and some orange. And when I was in one of our practice sessions, we we're meeting a conflict between two people and one person's concerns were like very much blue and amber values coming forth. And I was co-mediating with a, with a friend of mine in the program and she's like, I love her. She's like super green, like super, super green. And she didn't see that, that those amber concerns were even a problem because they don't exist in her world, right? Like she didn't tune into that or really feel that because she's never felt those impulses herself. And so one, I think that this with integral theory, all of the perspective taking is really helpful to like be able to one actually see it 
and feel it and know that it's real for other people. And two, and I love Heidi, how you kept on mentioning like how to communicate with different people of different stages. And something we learned in the training is, is doing a, a reframe, re, a paraphrasing what someone says by reframing it to a positive future focus. So if someone says, I hate my neighbor, my neighbor is a stupid, sleazy, you know, cheater. Instead of saying, oh, so what I'm hearing you say is your neighbor is a stupid, sleazy cheater when the neighbor is right there in the meeting, you reframe it and say something like, oh, so what I'm really hearing is you value integrity and responsibility or whatever, and you want your neighbor to embody these qualities. And so what integral helps you to do is it helps you to reframe unhealthy to healthy and to highlight the, the value structure that they're underneath that are generating their concerns and even kind of point the way to that so people can talk about that instead of attacking someone negatively. So that was, that was just, it was just, I'm still like super psyched about it. And um, this is a good call. Hi everybody. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So uh, super excited to be here. I have plenty of like beefs with blue, so I'm happy to trash them a little bit today. And uh, sorry if I couldn't talk last time, but I was in a bus, so it, it would have been weird and I would have sounded crazy. <laughs> we all would have. Uh, but happy to be here and thank you for all the enthusiasm about the platform and happy maybe at the end of the call, if we want to have a ch quick chat about it, what we can do with it, uh, I'd be happy to expand. Hey, everybody. No, Kate is still. Uh... Oh, hi. I, um, I, sorry, I'm late. I was at the, uh, Heidi probably mentioned at the Dharma and Conflict teleseminars, and I did, did most of those this week. And just, if you can, if you can only watch one, watch the Ginny White Law rerun. I think it was really something profound in the area of conflict. And also the Patrick Cassidy one was really brilliant too. And in his reframing of the memes, I thought was really an accessible way to present it so that it wasn't so hier hierarchical appearing, I think, and that would trigger people in a way. I thought it was really just a really powerful whole series of, it's just, it's kind of amazed me. I, I particularly liked the one ones time when the, I didn't really like the diversity one all that much, but then all of a sudden they got, somebody got in a conflict. Did you, were you there for that one, Heidi? Well, the, some guy came on and he, he, he basically was saying, you know, this is boring and I don't want to, <laughs> you got to like a conflict right with the presenters. And I, and I just loved watching the way that Diane um, came in and addressed that and really brought out in sort of like an NDC way, what the guy was really needing. And it was really, it was really touching then you know, to hear that conflict turn into like, oh, an expression of like, he just had some deep needs. It was really, it was quite beautiful. It's still on my replay list. It is at night at one o'clock or something it was, or even at three o'clock at night. So that was too much. I was uh, awake and for Tom Habib yesterday at, at 11 o'clock. He, he is really getting ever more brilliant in f figuring out the relationship uh, development and uh, how he used extramarital affairs for how, for growing and for knowing how to, to deal with it for the growth of the both and the, and the couple, the relationship. It was great too. But night at night at two o'clock, that's after five or six things I have listened, I couldn't do it. But I will go into the replay. I heard about it. So we have that then. Uh, as a demonstration of how to deal with conflict. Okay, so everybody has spoken. So let's go into blue. Up to you. What is blue or amber and experiences with that, situations, ideas? I just want to echo what I think, was it Kate just said, I forget which of you, Ginny Whitelaw was also at the What Now conference in Denver um, over, a, over a year ago. And yes, Heidi, I agree everything you said about the American integral conferences. It was very frustrating that it was so top down. Ginny Whitelaw knocked my socks off more than any of the other presenters. And she said something that totally plugs into what Paul was saying and some of the others of you, how do you engage other levels? She said, 
you meet them where they are and you fall in love with them. Hmm. Uh, okay, so I'll just drop that in the pool here. Um, in relationship to blue, especially, I find that that's true. And um, a way that I found like access to that from a mental way is uh, blue is centered around second person perspective. It's um, about a sense of um, really honoring other. And um, however, what I often find in, in blue is um, there's like my father really wants to, to be seen himself in honoring other. And so falling in love with him and his relationship with the divine or other really, really makes him happy, makes him feel seen, makes him feel um, connected and so on. Well, <clears throat> approach I've taken also is um, um, seeing the positive qualities in blue, uh, like the dedication of the family or the tribe, um, the um, value of working, you know, self-sufficiency, you know, some of the qualities, and it kind of allowed me to appreciate the people who adopted me. Uh, they were, they were, you know, my father wasn't blue, he was more rational and scientific level, um, but my mother was uh, Native American, they adopted me, uh, the couple, and she was high value on um, tribal and traditional and it's kind of allowed me to like reclaim, talk about, you know, transcend and then uh, include. It's allowed me to add the inclusion of my own upbringing after I was adopted around the age of six and appreciate their lifestyle because he had dropped out of the corporate world. I was a compass rubber, you know, sneakers uh, industry. And uh, like I said, she stayed rooted in a tribal origins. Uh, she was a Native American. And, um, it's kind of like, it, it kind of awakened me more and I feel more like a more sense of fulfillment in being able to, to um, appreciate that, that level. What I don't know how to do, and I'm sure today will be helpful, uh, you know, I like to comment, fall in love with the blue, uh, is that um, I don't know how to language with the other person um, that allows me to be understood by them and I to understand. And, and letting them know I understand them, but that that's still kind of a scramble for me. So um, I think that I think that's it that I want to say right now. Mm -hmm. I come from a German background, and Germany for hundreds of years was was rooted very strongly in blue, in the military culture, and obedience and duty. And so that was very heavy in, in our family, and it certainly has some very good sides, but certainly some downsides. Now we are headed heavily into green, and just living outside uh, the country, I have sort of missed uh, the changes. And I'm really astonished now when I come to Germany, the trains are not punctual anymore. There was a time where people said you could put your, your watch with the trains arriving. That's completely gone and things like that. The reliability has gone. And yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering about that. <laughs> I think some things in, in blue is really good to maintain. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I don't have a problem with blue because my family was all blue and they were lovely people. I loved them. They were, you know, and they were church going people. Like some were cops and the work for the police department. And, and so I never saw this sort of negative thing in blue, but I do notice when I go to New York city, just as you mentioned that, that everybody used to walk on the right side, you know, when it was normal that people would walk on the right and the other, it was just sort of a natural flow. Now everybody's on their phone. So everybody's just crashing into everyone. There's no order at all. It's like, everyone's just, you know, like bashing and crashing and walking up on your heels because they're, they're looking at your phone. So I think that sometimes that order is like helpful, you know, to get from place to place without people, you know, tripping and falling, you know, it's interesting. Yes, but, <coughs> excuse me. 
my sister-in-law, my husband's sister and her husband, ex to me, exemplify blue, the, that um, traditional kind of pre-modern level. They're, um, I, I'd call them country club Republicans. They are, both have um, um, postgraduate degrees. They're very educated, very high functioning, very, very devout Catholics. And they are Trump supporters. And so this has been, um, you know, to those people who want to speak to Blue, this has been for the last three years. My husband and I have this deep bond of love. I have bonded very deeply. They're my family now. And how do we even talk to them? We were vacationing with them for two weeks while Trump was inaugurated. And the only way we could deal with it then was just not talk about politics for almost the entire two weeks. We had to not go there at all. And finally, we connected the last three days and the way I mean, I see in them all the I see in them all the positives of blue. You know, where the trains run on time. I mean, what a terrific step this is up from red, from the barbarian level, where you have a larger. I mean, what it's a dogma, it's a religion, or it could be a secular religion like Marxism. But you have a higher cause that makes meaning of everything, and you devote your life to it. You are loyal to your family, to your community. You understand how everything works, but it's a very concrete way of understanding the larger picture. This is uh, for those of you who do Piaget, I don't know, Tim, um, this is where you're still pretty literal and at the lowest levels of blue, these are the people who think that the Bible is like the literal word of God or the Quran is the literal word of Allah. So you're very narrow in your application. Anybody who doesn't agree with your dogmatic literal verbal definition of the world is a heretic. And so the dark side is that you persecute them. And I see these qualities in my, very, in my beloved sister-in-law and her husband. And they're in their 70s and 80s now. And looking at the end of their lives. And, you know, I had a real opening with my brother-in-law. And they get into conspiracy theories when reality bludgeons them with not conforming to their view of their dogmatic view of how it all works, then they, they deal with it by going into the conspiracy theories. And that's when it's very difficult to stay with them. And because then I react viscerally to some of this crap that is polluting and mauling our political process. And I have to deal with that. And here's where I use NVC. This is my solution. I use the NVC on myself. And I have learned because I have learned the hard way that the other party, if there's a conflict, they are not going to hear me until they have really felt heard. And so sometimes I just have to remove myself, like even physically, go through my own process, go through the NVC, and it may take a while before I can come back and be really present with them. So I've had some very beautiful experiences recently with my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, but it took a process of three years to get there. Uh, I'm always happy when we're also bashing Germans. So <clears throat> glad to hear that they're becoming more Italians while Italians are not becoming more German. Uh, so personally, I, I actually do not have like a problem with blue when it's just at blue, because it's easy, at least for me, it's really easy to understand. I was lucky that I lived for one year in Canada. I was going to a creationist church for a year. So that was an amazing experience. So I got rid of all my allergies for when it's there, because it, once you're able to understand that thought structure, it, it, it's pretty obvious the behavior that comes with it. My personal beef is when blue remains latent as people grow through other stages. So you would have a very rational mind, but in your application, you would be very authoritarian because you, you know, generally rationality is not very judgmental. You know, if, you, if you're truly rational, you're very compassionate. If you're truly rational, you're not... Uh, you, you don't turn things into dogmas. And so I think when these two things get combined, there you, you still get a lot of problems where um, a lot of the discipline that comes, you know, I think Protestant society, Heidi, you mentioned, like it is still a, a rational society, uh, but it is imbued with this sense of duty and the heaviness of the sense of duty that is actually coming from before. And I think that a lot of the problems that we have in the, in the business world and in the general how our society is structured is it's still imbued with a strong sense of duty, uh, which is often very arbitrary and, and not really rational. And I think that, that doesn't do us a lot of good. 
duty and guilt yeah. if you don't uh, do what you are supposed to do. And the weird thing is then you intro, intro, how do you say, you, you have it inside then. When it, it, especially it, when it's rational. If when, it, when it's presented to you in a very rational way, you, you believe the duty, whereas when the duty is attached to, you know, flying wizards and, and, and fairy stuff, it's, it's easy to let it go. Yeah. So I, I, at least that's the, the one I have a beef with. And uh, in, the, in the session with uh, Ginny Whitelaw just now, I had a big insight into uh, this part of my <laughs> resistance to, to blue and uh, <clears throat> being forced into blue. So it was ooh, another recommendation to still sign up. You still can get some of the... Uh, um, conversations you won't get all of them because there are too many in two days or so and it's still free or you can buy it but really really good yeah and as i said blue uh i have i'm still under the spell let's say of many of these uh not good parts of blue of the constriction and you have to do that. Or when I, then I rebel against it and I don't want to do anything, uh, then, you know, it's still all conditioned of that. It's not, not really free. So, um, yeah, that's hundreds of years of in the DNA <laughs> imprinted. Well, I can, I can kind of, uh, go ahead, Kate. I was just saying, I, I, I would really listen to what Damiano was just saying, because I was thinking the same thing. It doesn't, blue doesn't bother me so much as how it is the unprocessed blue in like orange and green in particular shows up. And, and, it, and, and with the Mark Walsh's presentation, which is like, if you want something to laugh at, it, it's hysterical. He goes into the whole mean green meme. And I'm wondering if that, you know, how that plays in with the unprocessed blue. And obviously the logic isn't there with the, you know, we all include everything, but there nothing is absolute except for our absolute thought here that I'm telling you, you can't do this. And the sort of authoritarian thing of like, either you're in or you're out with our, you know, with our theories. Is, and is that, is that run process blue or orange? You know, where, how does that mix up? Cause it seems like it is sort of a mixture along with the red, you know, that Ken pointed out. Yeah. So, so Kate, I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that, so when it mixes in with other stages, like I know a lot of people green who are like blue, you know, and it's like the, they're really blue, like in their heart, like as it comes out, but the content is like green social justice kind of content, right? And my aunt is like that. And it's like highly, she has like a highly polarized view of like good and evil, black and white, literally uh, in the world. And um, it's like, it's like, what the hell? Like, you know, it's, I don't know. But anyway, um, for me, I, I grew up in a, a, you know, Buddhist family in Hawaii with, you know, Japanese family, lots of blue, right? Like, and, and Heidi was talking about it's in the DNA. Like, I understand, like, Japanese, like, in Japan, the trains still come on, on the second, you know, like, everything is so orderly and efficiency, and it, it creates tons of problems, incredibly high suicide rate due to, like, guilt and shame. I failed my family. I'm going to commit suicide with the samurai sword kind of thing. Uh, so there's a lot of unhealthy aspects, but I've come to appreciate the, the healthy parts. And, and the community that I grew up in Hawaii, um, a lot of them were like old Japanese people um, who grew up in Hawaii. And so they grew up coming to the Buddhist temple. And so it's for me, it's always been a different perspective because um, a lot of people, they associate blue in the West with like Christianity or Catholicism or that kind of thing. And for, so for me, it's been very different mm. with um, the Buddhism because people, because a lot of these I think what's different from my people at my temple is that even though they were ostensibly Buddhist, they weren't that religious. Like they were just blue and this, they just came to the temple because that's what their family did. So they didn't have like the religious dogma thing going. They were just like very, very devotional people who just showed up and worked. And I wrote an essay on how much I, I love these people. And one of the things I wrote about, which I really hated green is like, they never complained one. They don't complain at all. They, and it, I don't know if this is a blue thing or like, I, I'm still trying to figure out what's blue and what's a Japanese culture. Um, but they don't ever complain. It, and like a lot of them would have like massive like surgery or like really painful, horrible stuff. You know, a lot of them were like in war, like they fought the, the Germans in uh, the 442nd Battalion, 100th Battalion to get out of the Japanese internment camps. So that these guys were like, you know, in the trenches being sent on the front lines as I like can fodder. And like, they don't ever talk about their experience. They don't ever want any kind of self-recognition or like they have no like, 
desire to be recognized or, and they don't have any, like, um, yeah, they don't ever complain and they're just so stoic and so tough. And, and like, that's something I really admire that kind of Japanese samurai, like discipline and toughness and stoic attitude. And, um, and, you know, growing up doing martial arts, that was always important to me too. But like that kind of thing, it's like, yeah, it's definitely been different being in like Oregon countryside where the blue is a very different flavor, like this very different, like, you know, Trump, you know, like Karen Trump, like Trump and like, yeah, it's just, it's like, to me, that's like, oh, I guess I can see how people like don't like blue as much when you grew up here. But like in Hawaii, I have, I had always had a very good appreciation of that. And that's, that's, I'm conscious that's a big part of, still a big part of who I am today. So yeah, it's interesting to hear different regional and cultural perspectives on how blue manifests. I find it interesting uh, that you say that blue is not complaining. I didn't hear complaints of my, by my parents about the war or whatever was. So that might be, it might be blue and not, not necessarily cultural. It, I, if I may just, I think it's the big, blue is the beginning of the ego of no ego. It's the first moment where the ego becomes a negative object and starts to get kind of controlled. And, and there is a huge amount of freedom that comes with finally being a little bit rid of the ego. So I, I totally agree with Ryan and, and you on this. So there's a strong, um, in, in blue, there's a strong uh, quality and development of accommodation. You know what I mean? The, you know, that, like blue, um, the, um, that, that stage of we uh, going to school for the first time and learning the other you know, the second person and all that. So I see that in even many Trump supporters, accommodation. You know, they, they want a culture or, or environment where people accommodate each other. There isn't so much conflict or confusion or whatever. But what um, um, bothers me that I know if it's a, I think it's probably a shadow element, but I literally terrorized of inside my body. I feel terrorized by the uh, traditionalists that are taking up arms. Uh, and in the United States is proliferating with the military ization uh, of blue groups, you know, uh, that are um, hoping to eventually take total power in the country. And my coming from a um, assault background as a child um, in the orphanage, um, it really resonates through my body. So even though I'm feel I got a good handle on it. The thing is, it seems to just undermine my attempt to be compassion, to be able to be more compassionate and open with people that are very locked into the values of blue. So that that's where I really find it very um, distressing, you know, and very uncomfortable. Uh, in fact, if, if I were younger, I would be moving to Canada or some other country. Uh, that's how um, the violence here is starting to, um, you know, increase by uh, the right-wing militias and um, the uh, people really, really convinced that the way to straighten out America is bring it back to a, a traditional culture as they envision it. it. I don't know if I'm way off or what <laughs> on that. No, I, I... No, I, could I go? Because I haven't gone yet. Sorry, I think Karen... I, Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I always, I always find this, especially whenever I talk about um, like Christianity. Like I'm kind of unreservedly like I love almost everything about blue. I think I kind of, I don't really have the the bad background from, um, like like personally. Um, and I often find that I kind of whenever I talk to about people, they seem to have a lot more sort of bad experience like I sort of like have this experience of like trying to hold my passion and sort of trying to appreciate their suffering but there's just like um so much I love about blue I think one of the things is somebody can maybe correct me if I'm wrong but I think it's like one of the major moves out of like polytheism to having like one major god that's kind of like um entirely like overarching there's this kind of like um universal order that everybody um kind of bows down to um and in some ways, I really like the some of the black and white take on things like the good and evil. Um, I really kind of, I suppose as well, I was kind of finding myself disagreeing a bit with Damiano and Kate, just in the sense of, I understand your points of view and completely valid, but like, 
um, the other side of, I, I quite like when blue is injected into the higher stages, but I think that's me appreciating the um, positive parts of blue. Like I quite like blue integral. Um, I really enjoy how much blue triggers green um, to have like this kind of like rock solid sense of ethics and morality. I think the um, thing about sufferings, uh, it seems to me definitely true. There's almost like a, a, re a real acceptance that uh, suffering is a given. I mean, in, in Christianity, their master, you know, their, their prophet whoever gets nailed to a cross, and it's kind of that whole thing is about as much suffering as you can get, like physically, emotionally. Um, you know, he's kind of one of the most, he's the most ethical person on the planet, but he's kind of falsely accused and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I think as well, like personally, I, I find it like this thing between like red and blue. I really appreciate how much orange really contains blue and brings it into like this, um, so I say orange, red, red to blue. Like one of my favorite quotes out of the Bible is um, when Christ is talking to his disciples, they're going to go into this kind of hostile territory. Um, and he says, I might butcher the quote, but it's like, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. And I, I just really appreciate the, the power in that because maybe like moving out of green, but the, the wisest serpents like this kind of primal, savage kind of there's no naivety in that whatsoever you kind of like have all this potential violence of red that has a lot of wisdom in it but then this self-sacrifice to to do no harm and it was um there, there's so many quotes in the i suppose i have a particularly sort of christian um uh flavor of my appreciation of blue but there are so many quotes in that they're just they're just so powerful and i think as well i can't remember if i said this but i think there's a real thing of like the causal body really comes out at blue um this kind of like universal and also this sense of like um the the transcendent i could i could feel like my red kind of like kicking in like when everybody was talking i was like oh i've got to get like my voice in <laughs> to sort of uh advocate for blue um but yeah that's my bit now i am yes. doing blue order karen is now on <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Blue order. Yes. I, the, the, the wonderful and the horrible side of blue. And I'd like to um, jump on what Ryan said uh, with the beauty of blue from my experience with fam through of and through family members who are very much at blue. Some of these very, very deep blue conservative Christian people are some of the most decent human beings you will ever meet on the planet. Truly good truly sweet, truly kind and caring through and through. They're not faking it. Um, so my husband's cousins are Baptist ministers and I've, we spent some time with them and their families. And I have to just kind of put parts of my mental life on hold while I'm with them. But they, this time I've spent with them has been some of the sweetest. They truly care about other human beings. And these are people who deeply do not want to legalize gay marriage. They are terrified that the Lord God will strike the United States like he struck Sodom and Gomorrah. They're terrified because that's the law. That's God's law. But individually, when we go out to eat, they engage the wait staff. They truly care about whoever approaches them. They truly care about them from the heart as a human being. They don't care whether they're individually gay, bi, whatever gender. It doesn't matter to them individually. They, and, and, and so I, I had some of the sweetest experiences of my life hanging with these people. And I'm grateful that my family constellation allowed me to do that. So my personal experience with Blue has been, yes, these are salt of the earth. This is what a step up from red. And Damiano, I would reframe slightly what you said, I agree, but I see blue that as we're still very much in ego, we're still building the personal ego, but for the first time we are consciously surrendering it to something larger. It is, we put our little ego in service to something that is bigger to us and that gives our life beauty and meaning. And that's why, it's such a relief when red starts to get tired of itself and maybe just tired. It's so tiring being in constant battle for supremacy or being the underdog and serving the overdog. But then you can give your life 
to something that has greater meaning and the suffering doesn't matter then because your real life is in heaven or in the worker's paradise on earth or whatever greater cause. And so of course suffering, this world is a veil of tears. That's part of the whole blue approach. I suppose possibly, I don't know about other religion, religious communities, but the suffering is just, well, that's just kind of like breathing, you know? So, and that's the not complaining side. You just buckle down, you do it, duty, service, devotion, these beautiful sides. So this is, I've actually experienced in my life through these people, the horror side, the dark side of blue is more as a historian, the witch hunts, the crusades, the, you know, the, the, the heresy trials um, and, and the dark side that uh, which one of you, Ronald, uh, was, was talking about as we see it constellating, kind of precipitating out in our political life right now, the dark and the light. And blue may be, I'm thinking this, blue may be the most dualistic, kind of the most overtly dualistic. You have your dogma and then you have everybody who's the, the great enemy. And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering, maybe blue is kind of the most hardcore dualistic of the levels over and out. Um, that sense of service really stands out to me, and I feel like the, the service takes, um, it, it helps shift the dualistic nature of connection and relationship with people in Bloom, because rather than being um, opposed to each other, I find that if we turn and face one direction and head in that direction together, um, that sense of service and um, whatnot helps to change the nature of connection when conversing with people in blue. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, I, I really appreciate what you just said, Natalie and, and Karen. Sorry, Natalie, were you still talking? No. Oh, okay. I, I didn't see your mic turn off. But um, yeah, this aspect of like service, devotion, and like commitment to something higher than yourself. Like the people in Hawaii, it's like the ultimate antidote against like narcissism in a way because you're so devoted to something greater and I feel that really missing in like a lot of green communities where it's like a lot of emphasis on yourself or like my needs and my stuff and I really miss like that old like like at my temple of these people just like they have these salt of the earth just deeply deeply good human beings and I work for a lady uh, on the farm who's like super Christian like Eastern or the Russian Orthodox Christian you know and everything you said Karen like extremely against gay marriage that kind of thing but like she and I met her mom too. She's probably like in her seventies. Her mom's like in her nineties. They're saintly people. They're like in, they're like Saint Francis, you know, like type of people, and they're just deeply, deeply good human beings. And I call it. It's like to me, this is something else. I've talked to Paul a lot about this too. To me, there's a difference between what I call character versus consciousness, and a lot of like um, green and like even orange on up. The focus has mostly been on consciousness, and they haven't talked as much about character. And I think the thing about character is that it's easy to become judgmental if all you do is interpret life as, oh, you must, if that didn't go well, it must be because you have low character. You don't have character. And it's like the, uh, a more orange way of interpreting it, a situation could be like, oh, I, you know, this person didn't call you back, let's say, because maybe they forgot or maybe they're busy or maybe the person doesn't have good communication skills or it could be psychological. Oh, maybe this person has a lot of anxiety or trauma or something. I, I tend to be kind of, I have this kind of blue judgmental quality of like, oh, if the person doesn't do something, you must be of low character. You know, you must not be a very high character. But I do think in life, there are some issues that need to be framed in terms of character. And Paul and I have talked a lot about ethics and like good and evil and how sometimes the best way to frame something is like, no, this person really is an evil person. Like we're talking about Hitler and, and other examples of how and, and Paul, I'm going to stop talking here in a second. I want, if you want to, if you feel inspired to jump in on this, then I, I really want you to add to what I'm saying. But I just wanted to echo Karen, your um, what you were saying about these deeply, deeply good people and, and these people of this impeccable character, you know, and it just oozes out of them the, the, their human goodness. And I haven't seen that from other stages, even from Integral. And that's the, that's, and I don't know if this is a quality of blue or just the people that I know who just coincide with that. But it's just something that always is just like, I really respect, deeply, deeply respect these people. I think um, there are studies that in blue, for instance, the women are much happier than in higher stages of development. Um, I think in blue, you have really a, a framework which is giving you safety. And as long as you don't look out of it, 
you are you find your happiness in that and higher stages we, we begin to realize what we don't know what we don't have and then the discontentment and the frustration comes in and that's what i'm seeing with with green a lot you know but uh, i think blue is a sort of a um a safe island <laughs> somehow <laughs> as long as you have enough water around so you cannot you don't need to see what uh, what you are missing so i think from a historical point of view also makes sense because blue was the, the structure that had time to stabilize. Like you had agricultural societies for a really, really long time that, you know, unless some other civilization came and destroyed them, they were pretty fine. And, you know, in, in the course of a very short amount of time, we had like three, four, five new developments in 200 years that are completely in conflict with each other. And so we, we take it for granted that there are so many available, but before there was this one that was doing fine. And I think we, we do see a, a, a lot of this uh, difficulty right now. And, and of, of kind of rebalancing these states that never had a society that was stable enough to support them altogether, which is then an integral society. Um. I'm going to pick up on what Ryan said. I think for me, some of the crux of this is that um, I think it revolves around like free will. I think at blue, free will like really comes online in quite a big way. Um, like at red, you're kind of like, it's quite savage. It's just like, I'm just going to chop someone's head off because I'm more powerful. Whereas in blue, there's this massive um, dilemma between uh, good and evil. It's like, am I going to choose God or am I going to choose the devil? Am I going to choose uh, sin or to be holy? And I think this is why I get kind of fired up about the idea of like blue beyond just blue, like blue being combined with um, other levels because I do sometimes think it's quite appropriate to questions of um, shadow things I just think like Ryan was kind of alluding to where there's um, sometimes I see shadow being used as like an excuse like oh somebody was getting lost in their shadow or um, oh they're at, they're at red or they're at orange or whatever it is um, and I think it masks the the like the nature of evil um, whether or not somebody's choosing like i think you can kind of be there are degrees of being aware of shadow and if you actually are quite aware um personally i was looking into um andrew cohen kind of is a figurehead that i've mentioned a few times it kind of bothers me and it's like i'm kind of watching interviews and in my opinion i see this kind of shadow being used as an excuse and um I'm kind of like sitting on my gut instincts a little bit, like feeling out for the degree of choice to which somebody, I was watching an interview and it was kind of talking about like, oh, you know, I was, uh, I couldn't be with my vulnerability and um, all this kind of like, almost like the blue was the shadow that wasn't being integrated rather than like the, the sense of like getting off on power is a very different flavor. Like it's one thing to, I'm not sure if I'm going to articulate that well, but I think there's actually something quite big in that for, for the integral world. Um, the blue is not just blue. Like, blue is relevant, um, I think, at all the stages. No, I'm doing uh, authoritarian blue again. Uh, Kate is a long time that she wanted to speak. <laughs> I got lost with the evil thing, because... Um... I, I'll table that one, you know, because I work in prison, so I guess I deal with people that are termed evil all the time, but that's a big subject. I was thinking earlier about, I, I have a lot of volunteers, years ago, maybe 15 years ago, I had a lot of volunteers coming to my office to work on sending books to prisoners, you know, book prisoners write us with all their sad stories, and, you know, horrible stories of being in prison, and we send them books. And um, so Naropa would always give us a whole lot of volunteers, so I'd have a huge crew of Naropa kids over there supposedly sending out the books. Then one year I got a girl come from the Christian seminary down in Denver and she came up, drove all the way up to Boulder and she really wanted to help with the prisoners. And she, it was like, the, it was kind of funny because she would just sit there and she'd read the letters, pack, look really carefully for a book that would fit the prisoner, put, you know, and, and send the book. And so the Naropa kids would kind of come to me and say, she's not very empowered, you know, cause they're all about empowerment for women, you know, empowerment. And the Naropa kids would be all kind of, they, they were they were in their teens. They were the early AmeriCorps kids. And they were kind of, um, they were doing something, doing the letter, but mostly what they were doing was connecting with each other. 
and hanging out and having a good time and reading letters to each other. And, you know, they were, it was, it was just this different quality of the kind of service mind that the girl, and the girl came to me and she said, am I doing something wrong here? You know, because the other, the Naropa, it was like a culture war here. The other, she, the other kids were making her feel like she was doing something wrong by just doing what, you know, I'd asked her to do. Because she said, well, am I, am I supposed to be like sitting here socializing with everyone? And, and she couldn't kind of get her head around it. And then she, she eventually just left, you know, because she couldn't sort of <laughs> handle the Naropa kids, make her feel bad about herself, I guess. And she was actually doing a really, like you say, just a really beautiful person doing the service work, you know, and really wanting to help. Not that the Naropa kids, they wanted to help too, but they also wanted to connect and show their dance moves and you know, talk about their classes and talk about Ken Wilbur and, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, and be empowered. You know, nobody in the blue meme is talking about being empowered. Um, yeah, Kate, I can, I can appreciate what you're, what you're getting at too. Um, so here's, here's my question. Okay. So Jeff Salzman was talking about this and he said, he was talking about a school shooting on the Daily Evolver. He said, he said, the three stages interpret something like that differently. Blue says it's an act of evil. This is an act of evil, right? Orange says it's, it's mental health. And green says change the gun laws. And, you know, whether that, how accurate his assessment is, you know, whatever. We'll just use that as an example. So my question is, as, as integral people, this, this interpretation of something that this is an act of evil or, or good and evil, does that have any usefulness for us? And when should we interpret situations like that? Uh, or at least supplement our interpretations of, how, of like, oh, it was a mental health issue with the idea of good and evil and different ethical implications in there. When, when can that be helpful? I, I can advance just an idea based on the brief exchange between Paul and Kate, because I think that was very revealing in a sense that I think we, we, both, we all agree that somehow blue fits into the ethicalness of what is being done in terms of how egocentric is the thing that I'm doing and how much is it being done in service? And I think that, that we agree on. But Paul, when you, like, uh, Paul, when you made an example of evil, you didn't mention prisoners, you mentioned Andrew Cohen. And I think that that, that raises an interesting point that I, I wouldn't call it evil, but definitely as the level of development increases, the amount of damage that you can do increases vastly. And the importance to have ethical structures is even greater. So if you're an enlightened teacher, having, you know, some, even if it's a shadow, but it's telling you to behave well and to be careful not to damage others, it's probably pretty important. And so in, my answer would be that it is, I wouldn't frame it in terms of evil, but responsibility increases with, you, with the awareness that you have, so your actual freedom to make free decisions and the responsibility and the impact that they have. And I do expect more from a spiritual teachers than I expect from a criminal or some person who has had bad luck in their life. In the end though, we live in a universe of causality, so free will doesn't exist, so it's all mute. But these are concepts that within this world of freedom, we can use not to make too much damage onto each other. Just smart I programming. I disagree on the damage done. That you know, I, I don't think Andrew Cohen has done as much damage as, say, the Rwandan genocide or prisoners that I've met that have murdered five to ten people. Can uh, I? Uh, can but, I well, say? Sorry, 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 but that that the question is is a different one. The question is, would we frame the Rwandan genocide in 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 terms of evil, and how differently would we do it in terms of Andrew Cohen? And you you basically intend there is one variable. It is the degree of damage, so which is a variable that I didn't take into account in my argument, and I would agree that that needs to be included. But if the massacre had been made by enlightened people, it would be even more evil. I think that was my argument. Sorry, Kate. Could I could I say something? If uh, you're going to go, Kate, or um, to me, what I hear, and I think, I, I often hear this, this aversion to good and evil is because of blue, it's black and white. It's kind of, and I kind of find it, I, in no way did I compare Andrew, what Andrew Cohen did to Hitler or genocide or any of this kind of stuff. But that's kind of my point, is that um, good and evil is, 
I think at the higher levels and possibly what, what could come out of integral is that it's relative. Um, I'm a little bit, I have a little bit of pushback down me and I'm not sure if you said that free will doesn't exist or, um, okay. <laughs> so I, I definitely like I've pushed back about, about around that. And also I think that free will is relative as well. Um, it's not black and white, like, like, um, probably blue would say. And I think, um, in many ways, those two good and evil and free will and whatnot are, um, being relative, I think is a, is a uh, useful conversation. And part of me would say that, some of um andrew cohen's was I, I think a definition to me of evil is kind of like deliberately exercising your power like causing people pain and you know you're doing that and that that can be a debate uh, and some of that is like me somewhat like in my own gut instincts or just kind of looking at some of the facts um but i, I think the concept of good and evil was pretty possibly pretty useful um integral because it brings in ethics and responsibility and all this kind of stuff Yes, ethics and responsibility, I think that's at the core of blue. And what's emerging in me now is a synthesis of some things in the past. Let me see if I can grasp it. Um, with the value that blue holds as we go on up, you know, at blue, the whole concept of ethics, we begin to collectively, individually and collectively intuit that there is a moral law, however we put that in our cultural and religious terms. And at the healthiest level, that stays with us. And what's coming up in me now is from the Jewish mystical tradition of the Kabbalah, that there was a previous creation. And the, the highest, Ein Sof, the, the highest transcendent levels tried to pour the spirit into creation, into the vessels. But the vessels broke. The vessels could not withstand the impact of this high spiritual vibration. And they broke. And that created all the dark, those shards the Kelepoth, I think they're called, are the dark spirits that cause the evil and suffering, you know, the conscious, deliberate evil, the cruelty, and so on, like the Rwanda massacre. That's a kind of Jewish mystical um, mythology, if you like. <clears throat> I have all been cognizing this, what the vessels needed to hold themselves together was moral fiber, a really blue term, moral fiber. That is the positive value of blue to me the qualities of character, the ethical qualities of character, and the strength, the endurance, the dedication, the dedication of the, the, the military in its positive sense where you go into that fight knowing that you may die or be maimed because you are serving a higher cause, the strength, the endurance, the will to serve something positive, you know, moral fiber, all those wonderful qualities of these good people on that side. And this, when we have consolidated at that level, individually and culturally, this moral fiber, to me, I imagine it as like the straw in the adobe bricks that keeps the bricks, that gives them structural integrity, tensile strength that holds them together. And so this is, this is kind of how I'm, I'm putting this together in my imagination as we go, this, the, the straw and the adobe brick in the clay bricks, the moral fiber that strengthens the vessels, our vessels of body and personality to hold the higher, as we go, go on higher up into higher states and higher stages, both that we can contain that higher intensity without shattering the lower vessels. So. Yeah, I'm going to have to leave um, shortly, uh, so I just want to jump in. Uh, on the higher moral intelligence uh, level, um, where I don't have to use the blue for me anyway, but I'm still not completely knowing where I'm at, but I know the concept of uh, that Wilbur talked about, absolute realm and relative realm of truth, that the absolute realm of truth is uh, where I'm kind of like trying to work out you know, what is universal morality that I could be really maybe absolutist about, but on day-to-day -day living and um, ethical concerns that are in a relative truth realm, how it can be more open and flexible and acknowledge people from different morality systems or perspectives and that kind of thing. The other thing I want to thank you guys as a group is the um, confusion I think I'm in about the red, misplaced red, that sometimes is freighted through um, uh, in the blue community uh, by some members, you know, because the thing is how come, you know, like some of my neighbors are Trump people and they're the best people that you can meet, like was said earlier, 
But on the other hand, there are a lot of terrorists around here today um, that um, <clears throat> um, see taking you out as a uh, uh, part of the mission uh, to make America a better place. So um, I want to thank you guys before I leave that you, you really helped me um, become more confused, but also have more clarity. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Ronald. <laughs> thank you, Ronald. That's called integral. <laughs> I wanted to continue uh, from Karen and, and uh, recommend uh, Patrick Cassidy when he talked about the development from fighter to, to soldier to warrior. And uh, he, he did the levels of development in these terms. And what I hear you, hear you say was the, the soldier, no? who for the first time is not, uh, not fighting anymore, but is doing it for a higher cause. And then the warrior is still going on. So if you have the chance, listen to it. Sorry, Kate, I have interrupted you. And then it seems to me that Tim wants to say something. <laughs> I just I wondered if Paul could or somebody maybe Natalie since she's done a lot of shadow stuff could say something about what Paul's idea of, of um, or Paul what you meant by using the shadow as an excuse and then that brings to me what is the integral definition of shadow because I think it's a little different the way we, we work with shadow work than the way you know the typical Jungian therapist works with shadow work. Yeah maybe Paul can you say that again because Natalie wasn't here when you were talking about that. Um, yeah, um, I think part of it is there is, there is, um, choice around shadow. Um, shadow often comes with a kind of, I think, I think just that, to be honest, like there, there is choice whether or not you own shadow or not. And there are some instances where I'm like, you know what, if you took the average person off the street, they'd have enough human empathy to not act like, uh, some of what I'm being critical of. So I'm kind of suspicious of someone who's like super high level, uh, mistreating people to that degree, um, and then blaming it on shadow. And also an article that me and Ryan were, we thought was pretty great was, I think um, sometimes shadow is like way overused. It becomes, um, I forget the word, maybe you can help me out, Ryan. There was a word that he begins with S. Um, and basic, it's almost like, to me, it's kind of compounding like upper right and upper left. It's kind of, I see sometimes shadow in this bizarre situation where it's kind of like, you're, you're, you're with a psychopath or something. And almost it's like, well, I'm triggered. Therefore, it must be my shadow. And I have an inner psychopath inside of me. And that's why I'm um, getting triggered rather than like more emphasis on the upper right, the actual like objective stuff happening. And I see that happen in um, communities where it's kind of, misbehavior in the kind of objective realm is then kind of um shadows used to kind of disguise it like if anybody has a problem with it then it's their shadow rather than um and that was one of his points actually that this article that i'm referring to in reference to lots of people including caring that in some ways it's more important the damage that's done the actual objective um actions taken than um the, the person who's done the bad deeds, their own personal shadow or their own like inner experience, like the other quadrants are just as important, if not more so. I've got a, a couple of thoughts here. What you just said, Paul, really reminds me of the basic equity um, orientation of whether we're looking at intentions, we're looking at impacts. And I think that's a really, really helpful sort of conceptual or sort of vocabulary technology and being able to name these things like I really liked um, Natalie's hand movement earlier when she talked about where are we when she talked about kind of speaking to someone from here versus speaking to someone from here and being able to go together facing the same direction I have this image from Karen's um, moral fiber concept of of people as these vessels and I almost feel like they're conduits and our vocabulary can choose where we bring the water, where we send the energy of the communication. And NVC, Ryan, when you were talking about reframing, for instance, and understanding the values that are speaking to the blues, I think NVC can 
well, it doesn't have to be NVC, but that, that, that resonance and having the vocabulary to be able to say what the underlying um, interest is in mediation terms or needs are in, uh, in NVC terms. I've found with my born again Christian, um, extremely, extremely moral, incredibly compassionate uh, younger cousin that we don't really have disputes anymore, but partly it's because I'm choosing my vocabulary very clearly because if he's a con, he's a hose or something, and I point him at something that has been named by his subculture politically, it's a no-go. You know, it's like aiming water at a wall. But if I choose the underlying interest, if I, if I question, if he says something and I can immediately feel that isn't in line with me, and then I try to do a little bit of like, maybe Karen, it's like your internal NBC. It's like, well, well what is it then? Because I must be thinking about it the wrong word level if there's a conflict. And I can just shift down and find the underlying interest where he and I are completely together. And then it's just like focusing that, that vessel, not at a wall. It's just focusing in a place where it's open and available. So I feel like blue is incredibly available, but it takes really, really clear vocabulary so that I'm not pointing it into something that they've already determined was evil. If I just shift the word that I'm using, sorry, I'm not very good with this camera. Um, but if I shift the, if I shift the word that I'm using, then there's this tremendous amount of space and they absolutely can go very, very far with it. So. And that way blue feels like it's really about connection. It's one of the uh, stages that's about we rather than I. And so totally. whatever we can look at together, like, you know, we're sitting here with the ocean I'm imagining sitting with my dad, having religious conversations, we debate quite a bit and, um, but then end up turning the conversation in a direction where we're uh, finding some sense of commonality and it ties the whole thing up, um, the, the whole sense of connection up. Towards it quite a bit. And, and like Kate, or, uh, Kate, when you're talking about uh, the woman who came in to work with you as a student, who didn't necessarily relate to using her time to, to increase self-expression or to meet up with her fellow students, but she had this, this motivating factor. Again, it's, I, I keep seeing this image of like a sprinkler system or an irrigation system. There's all this vital energy and blue. If the vocabulary is used well, we see these incredible acts happen that aren't, I think, very much in uh, contrast or conflict with other systems. It's, it's just it's that lovely idea that it's then embedded in whatever higher content and con context you get. But it's, yeah, I really like your moral fiber statement because you need something to focus. You need a certain strength to allow the vitality through. So I, I really appreciate that. In fact, I had a beautiful, oh, are you? I had a beautiful meeting of minds with my husband's brother-in-law, the very Catholic guy. He's in his 80s and has all sorts of very serious health issues. And like every Catholic I've ever known well enough to know this, um, both my sister-in-law and her husband are terrified of dying. It's funny how Catholics seem to be terrified of dying in my personal experience. But we had such a meeting of hearts and minds immediately after the Ken Wilbur conference, because they live in Denver, and I went and stayed with them for two days after I left the What Now conference with Ken Wilbur 14, 15 months ago. And he took the conversation to a depth that he was kind of test he was testing because he's looking i mean he knows he's on the way out of his physical body he's more he's less in denial about that than his wife is he can't talk about it with his wife my sister in law because she's in total denial but he knows it and he's he's looking for an easy landing and so he engaged me in a conversation about my beliefs he knows i'm not a catholic he knows that i have a meditate and I have very deeply held spiritual I mean uh, an approach to the spiritual world and we ended up with him drawing out of me my definition of a mountain that's 12,000 feet tall and I was kind of putting one of the Wilbur's levels at every I didn't put it in, in integral terms but a mountain and you're going to see a different landscape at 1,000 feet and you're going to see it 4,000 feet and you're going to see it 6,000 feet but a religion is like 
one side of a mountain. So let's say Christianity is the north side and Buddhism is the south side and Islam is the east side. Every one of those is going to have a 1,000 foot level, a 2,000 foot level, a 10,000 foot level. It's the same mountain. Every side of it will get you to the top. But at each level on each side, you're going to see a different landscape, but you're all on the same mountain. And, you're all, and he kind of, he kept at it. I mean, he wouldn't drop it. He kept drawing this out of me. And he found, it was like for him, this was finally a lot of things. He'd been a very devout Catholic all his life, like Knights of Columbus, the whole thing. And somehow for him, that step he was making as he was confronting his own mortality in his face, that suddenly he wouldn't have put it this way, but I saw this he kind of got a little above blue enough to see that other people don't have to be wrong for me to be right. And he needed to go there for his own peace of mind because, you know, he's engaged in the world. And so this narrow Catholic that everybody who's not a Catholic is going to hell wasn't working for him anymore. But I mean, to break out of that would have been too shattering. So just, I, I, I kind of started with what you said, Tim, and I'm not sure how that relates back. But yes, I had a very beautiful meeting with him. And it was, it was the situation. It wasn't something I was trying to put on him. It was something that he reached for in me after a relationship of decades of growing mutual trust. I just wanted to say, Tim, thanks so much for sharing. I, I, that was awesome. And I, yeah, totally resonate. That's everything I learned in the last four, you know, past three weeks. So yeah, thank you. Did you did you make the coffee? Yeah. Did you um, use the whole thing? Yeah. Um, are you gonna go to them? Um, yeah, I enjoyed that. I just thought there was a, even just that hand gesture. Frankly, I remember somebody was saying that. Um, I think I was on one of the conflict calls yesterday. I think it was the it was a parenting one. And just that, like, I thought that is such a great way to do with the lower levels. Like, there are so many times where I'm um, unhealthily headbutting greens, or I get kind of annoyed, which is, um, it's not it's not terrible, depending on how much I do it, because some of that is hashing my own stuff. But, like, even this week, just an experience of, like, appreciating where people are. It's often surprising how much they will actually um, get on board with what you're saying. And actually, like, go that that uh, direction, and it sort of seems like sort of you take something negative which has a truth, but then you spin it on its head. I forget what the example. I think you said something right, where it's kind of like, oh, "I hate my neighbors," rather than. Um, I, I, I was thinking of a, a conversation where I was talking to Greens about um, uh, it was gender, so it was kind of like men are powerful, women are powerful. And they were like really struggling with that. It was kind of like, oh, that doesn't feel very good. Rather than like flipping on its head of like say feminine being like more nurturing or more i don't know um unconditional loving and all this kind of stuff sensual it was easy for them to just jump on board with that where they could hold uh the male and female rather than it being like you know one side is losing out because whenever there's like some power differential greens are obviously going to get i i think justifiably upset so, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I think that's probably such a great model, as simple as it is, for engaging with um, lower levels and, and whatnot. Um, earlier, Kate, and some of you were asking about uh, shadow. And I'm wondering if, uh, was it Paul, you were wanting to find another word that was S? Was that suppression? Or something like that. Um, but anyways, what was coming to mind when you were talking about focusing of energy, I feel like blue is one of the stages where rather than things being very scattered, um, our sense of disgust helps to uh, create barriers, helps to create a sense of polarization and a filter to um, establish our sense of like values and that, that disgust when engaged um, a bit more consciously. Um, there's, there's a difference between shadow and suppression. I feel. Um, I feel like shadow is something that is uh, suppressed very unconsciously and suppression is um, you can be aware that I'm setting something aside because this is not something that I believe I don't want to engage with it um, and so on uh, but it, it can be a more conscious process and so it's one way to help create healthy blue and also to uh, 
um, reincorporate some of our shadow in uh, a way that is a bit more conscious and more of that like suppression healthy choice when we're at higher stages. Can I, can I ask Natalie a question? Yeah. What is the difference between shadow and a character flaw? Um, good question. Um, well, I feel like shadow mostly is, uh, again, something that's unconscious, but a character flaw uh, could be unconscious, could be uh, conscious. So if something is conscious and you know what it is and you decide not to improve it, yeah, the, the, I think that's what Paul was trying to get at, of like, if that is framed as shadow, because I, to me, character flaw is kind of like a blue thing in some ways. So if that's framed as shadow and you're not, and you're not taking responsibility for something you know that you should be doing, right, then I think framing it as a shadow can be problematic. Paul, is that, is that accurate? Yeah, that's exactly accurate. I mean, I see, uh, I, hmm. I, I just see it like there's, um, and this is where degrees come in. Like I can tell there's way more conscious awareness going on than they're, than they're letting on. And also I really wish I could remember this word, but it's kind of like, um, there's a side of shadow, which is, I guess it's slightly different where it's almost like childlike thinking. It's kind of, um, I guess it, it starts to borderline on like magical thinking, like everything that is going on outside of the world. If I react to it or like, how do I explain it? There's a way that, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to explain it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's got something to do with like the objective and the subject of just being like completely merged. Um, where everything's just kind of called shadow and there's this uh, blurring of boundaries. Um, I, I come at shadow very much from a Jungian background, which may be somewhat different than Ken Wilber's group defines it but to from the union background the shadow is anything that we are unconscious of that we might potentially i mean there's the deep unconscious that's never going to be conscious and that's most of our personality frankly but the shadow is like i imagine a bright light i'm facing the light the shadow is back behind me where i cannot see it unless i turn around and look at it the shadow is by definition something we are not that is not in our waking conscious. And we can cast things into the, sh the shadow is not ne necessarily negative. It's just what we happen to be unconscious of. And in Jungian terms, you can have a golden shadow. And the th one of the things about the shadows, we tend to project it because it is very much part of us. It's actually a fairly close to the surface of our conscious mind. It's when we start to turn our attention inward introspectively, it's one of the first things we encounter. It's very close to waking consciousness. I think in terms of a threshold of consciousness like a diaphragm, when something that is an unconscious content of our psyche is getting ready to become conscious, which by the way happens at every one of these levels, we become conscious of more of ourselves. It comes at us through our shadow because that is that next level below the, the conscious threshold. So it's not necessarily negative by definition. It's something that we happen to be unaware of that could in theory be a, con a content of consciousness. And that is precisely what we tend to project onto others, which is what is in our shadow. It's very close to us. It's attached to us. And we see it out in the world, we don't see it in us. And growing up, coming up the levels is, I, I, have, a, I have an essay about this. It is very much a matter of at each level up, we have projected something that was never before conscious into the outer world. And then in the, as going up that level, we proceed to introject it and make it part of our conscious content. At beige, we are projecting the fact that we are conscious at um, purple, magenta, we project our sentience. We see it in every rock and bush and bend in the river and then realize, oh, that's me that's conscious and has an active will. At red, we project our capacities. I have the capacities to forge this piece of iron. I'm a smith. I have skill at this. Well, I'm going to invoke my god, Hephaestus, the god of the forge, because we project it onto the gods. And, you know, you can go up all the levels like this. So the shadow is a very fertile, positive, um, necessary part of our psyche. And we have a very dynamic interaction with it all the time. And the growing up and the waking up very much and the shadow work are 
so necessary for each other. So um, I, I would say, Ryan, a character flaw is something, you know, a, a, a completely different topic. Um, you necessarily, when you're dealing with, 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 with toxic stuff, that we tend to push that into the shadow because we don't want to look at it. And then it can definitely relate to our character flaws. So I would say character flaws are a separate subject that may be a small subtopic of shadow. So that's my two cents worth over and out. I have a very provocative question to you Americans. Um, normally what is in your shadow you get angry about and you reject it and so on. What is it about that you are so much upset with Trump? What has it to do with your shadow? Well, you could say he is our shadow. I think, uh, I think that Trump is uh, part of the, some of the things that he says and what he does are conflicting with a great many, especially in the liberal side, a great many people who uh, are comfortable being critical of a certain number of things in society, but they haven't yet grieved or owned some of the levels of suffering that creates their own privilege. So Trump is um, dangerous because it, again, calls even more into mind sort of our history and our privilege. That's my belief. So if you take Trump away, we can all agree to just fight over um, one chunk of in inequalities, which is what the mainstream um, liberal, I would say, uh, politics has been for a while, but they haven't been willing to talk about uh, some of the finer points of privilege. In, in, I'm talking about like the, the large party, big money politics, which sort of dominates. So my feeling is that Trump kind of presses on a bruise for America, and there's a lot of people who don't want to feel that much pain. They don't want to have to engage with that. They don't want to have to bring that much either compassion or what we see more ugliness is rather than trying to engage with it and build the kind of relationships that would create for healing, we want to other it. We want to judge it. We want to uh, diminish, despise, scorn. I guess scorn's the big one. So whenever I see that big, big scorn, I just think, oh, that's the shadow part. And what has it to do with you? I mean, not personally you, but you uh, Americans. Can it also be that you are uh, uh, sort of disowning this, uh, this power to just not be, just do what you want, you know? Just uh, uh, get your power out. So we have so much come up to, to be educated, blah, 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 blah. Maybe that might be a shadow part which wants to... to Again, behave like a child, you know, and do my way and, and, and get away with it. Just, I mean, that's now a personal uh, development thing, shadow. Uh, I'm just asking if that can be the... I actually have some respect for Trump. There's many times when I've um, sat and like felt into what I imagine his experience might be that he... There's a lot of things that are really, really meaningful and heartfelt for him. And it's just that he doesn't have the conversation, the communication skills, and um, some of the bigger picture thinking um, to implement some of the things that are actually really important for this country. I feel like there's a reason why half of our country is very, very supportive of him in some ways. Um, and so... <clears throat> I'm uh, not talking about him. I'm talking about you, about mm -hmm. you people, and not about the person Trump. He's only the, the how do you say, mm -hmm. the, the figure which I'm using for, to, to, to see what is in your shadow culturally. I think it's our inability to see our own language and how alienating it is. Green, you know, this language of talking about privilege all the time. I had, you know, I, I, I went to a social justice meeting and, and, and everyone there, I said, was yelling at me for not going and educating the people in the prisons about white privilege. And um, I, I think that it's kind of like we need to look at our own language. He's a, yeah. he's a manifestation of us. Yeah. What, you know, it's like Mark said, he's like a boil on our face. It burst and it was everything that we hate. It's just like manifesting in full force because we didn't integrate that stuff. Can I, can I say something? Because I think this is an example of exactly what I'm talking about, which is um, 
possibly anyway where I don't have a beef with shadow. It's the misuse of shadow as a word. Like to me, there's a big debate to be had to be whether or not it's shadow or not. Like just because you're really fucking pissed off at Trump or whoever it is doesn't necessarily mean it's shadow. It's only if it's unreasonable um, anger or reaction. If it is reasonable, then it's just healthy. So it sounds like the question you're posing, Paul, is how to, sorry, Kate, go ahead. That's the answer that every prisoner I, I ever met asked them, um, basically, why did you, what, did you feel you had choice to do what you did? And they all say, absolutely not. They had no choice. So yeah, is it shadow or was it like an amygdala hijack that happened? Yes, it maybe was an amygdala hijack that happened. They were reacting to extreme fear or whatever. Nevertheless, not everybody does. And so, you know, I think the shadow work, the word That's not what I'm saying, to be fair. Um, it's, it's like the integration, you know, some people have more integration to be able to con con stand up to people attacking them, I guess. It's like the Aikido principle. And Paul, the more one is pissed off of something, the more it has to do with, with you being pissed off. With your own... <laughs> To me, I think that's a shadow of shadow. To me, if it's healthy anger, it's healthy anger. It's not your amygdala sparking up too much. The question is, what is healthy anger? This is a whole different conversation because that you cannot really make a good distinction but which is healthy or not because you are driven by your own experience and by your own conditioning. So I, I, I would say, at least I use that for me, when I'm very much triggered in one way or the other, I know that has to do with me and not so much with a trigger uh, hook, let's say. <laughs> so, I mean, in this case, as Trump, he is doing some crazy things objectively, but as this is this huge, everybody is, is making a huge story out of that. I'm asking myself, what is that in the American culture and even in our cultures, but we are a little bit less involved, you know, and <laughs> we can more see him like a, a puppet or something, or I don't know what. Uh, what, what is it in your culture which is making this outcry, especially in the left-wing culture? Can, can, I, can I advance a theory? Because, I mean, anyway, I come from a left-wing background, so I'll, I cannot answer as an American, but why as a left-wing person I would be? And, I, and why so many people like to vote for Trump? This is a bit extreme, and I may be wrong, I'm just throwing it for fun. Like a, I think poor people vote for Trump because they feel empowered. Because what he communicates is, if you believe it, you can get it. This is something that the left completely rejects because it, it's like Ken Wilber says, they're externalists. So they place outside of the self the, the circumstances of their success without realizing that this is profoundly disempowering for a lot of people. Because it, it grounds you in this sense of victimhood. It grounds you in this sense. And many people who you wouldn't expect to vote for Trump, they vote from this standpoint. They say, no, I refuse to be a victim. I refuse to consider myself this and that. And I do believe that the reason why right-wing people are richer than left-wing people is because they have an inner congruence with success and wealth. You cannot accomplish success and wealth if you don't believe that it is owed to you, if you're not congruent with it. And so, my take is that the Trump, like the left and the right, are really struggling with this idea that, well, actually, if you are, it is often more your inner structure that determines your success than your outer structure, but your inner structure is a product of environment. And to me, that's the marriage of the left and the right, is to perhaps begin to bring a lot more attention to what, as an individual, you can do to accomplish all you want, obviously granted some basic common opportunities, but on the other hand, realizing that you can accomplish a lot. And how do we create, for example, educational system, um, parenting system, and so on and so forth, that maintain a healthy balance between care for the world and a sense that I can accomplish anything, become a billionaire and become president. And he's just the ultimate troll, because if he can become president, everybody can become obviously if you get a couple million dollars to begin with but so just my take is that there is this conflict between internalists and externalists where the internalist probably needs to have a comeback in the left in a context that is not ego driven i don't know whether that was 
clear at all. It's just something I've been thinking about lately. So, so Heidi, I, I just wanted to answer your question as an American and um, really quickly. And, and I've talked to a lot of Trump supporters and I can say it's really different for everyone. There's a lot of nuance. I have some friends who are pretty left wing on every issue, but they just really don't like Muslims. So they voted for Trump, right? So it's like very, there's million different, some of it's like economic reasons, like jobs are disappearing in the Midwest. I, my, I'm out of a job. He said he's against trade. I'm voting for Trump, right? So, but for me personally, I don't really have a huge problem with Trump on the emotional level. I'm kind of like, okay, I'm kind of grateful for Trump because now my candidate, I'm backing Andrew Yang. I'm just focused on getting Andrew Yang elected in 2020. So I'm just, so I'm just like, okay, Trump paved the way for my guy. He's kind of like the Mongols, you know, he opened up the tra the Silk Road. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to hit that path and get my guy elected. But um, for me, the shadow of green is this, is kind of like, and I think this is, when I look at Trump rallies and like, people chanting, build the wall, build the wall. And thinking about it from a mediation perspective and trying to tune into underlying interests or needs. For me, the shadow of that has really been produced in green, and this is happening in Japan too, and my dad talk, talks about this all the time, is this really anti-Americanism. It's like this anti-nationalistic kind of thing of like, oh, America has done all these bad things. You know, people like Noam Chomsky talking about all the bad things America has done. A lot of it is true, you know, a lot of it is true. But people, there's so many people who are angry at this kind of anti-American thing. And they, to, to them, voting for Trump is a symbolic act of taking pride in America and, and building, make America great again, right? I mean, it's, it's building the wall as a symbol of an assertion of American pride. And, and honestly, like, that's probably my most conservative blue tendency is Japanese people are very nationalistic. And I take a lot of pride in being an American. And I remember, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a shadow moment I had, I'll admit this, I'll confess, I'll confess with this. So during the World Cup, I was walking around Portland, and this is when Mexico was playing Germany in the World Cup. And there were some people walking around, ostensibly they were, they were Mexican. And they, had, um, they, were, they were walking around carrying the Mexican flag. And I had this moment of like, you fucking, like, this is America, what the, like, like, it's like this ultimate, like, amber nationalistic, anti-multiculturalist attitude of like, how did, and I was like, whoa, 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 okay, it's okay, you know, but I, I had that moment of like, hyper blue, like, judgmental, like, a very, like, a Trump moment of like, like, this is America, don't bring that shit over here, you know, um, and I don't have that very often, but it, it does, it does come up in me a lot, because, you know, my background, with the, my, my great grandfather was first Japanese person to be killed in an internment camp, and all of my, what did my Japanese uh, ancestors do after that happened? They joined the American military to fight to prove that they were American citizens. Like, like what other group would sacrifice themselves just to prove that they were loyal to America, right? So that, ja that nationalistic, you know, patriotism runs really deep in Japanese genetics and culture. So I have that too. That's my amber shadow. So I, I get it. Like when people want to vote for Trump to assert their Amer pride in being an American, like I can get that. So I don't have a lot of problem with Trump on an emotional level. I just disagree with him on policy. Thank you. We are almost out of time or we are out of time. What I really um, would like that we do is sort of a closing round. Uh, what my interest still is, what do you see how can we include a healthy blue in our personal lives? Because the tendency is to, um, how do you say, abdict blue, to, 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 to deny blue. And, and when you want to impl implement rules or oh, you are blue or something, you know, uh, also in, in integral uh, circles. But for me, uh, a healthy blue needs to be part of our lives. So uh, the question, what you think and how uh, it could show up in your life or wherever. Well, I need to duck out pretty shortly here. Um, so I'll go first. Um, feel like I'm recognizing how valuable uh, reincorporating blue uh, into green is really significant for the transition into integral stages. And um, for me, it's about recognizing the context that I'm in. What are the rules in the environment um, that I'm and the people that I'm conversing with that culture? and being able to take on that lens and then maybe take on a different lens and combine them here and there. And um, yeah, being flexible with different, different uh, types of systems of blue. Um, I think 
the selecting common ground and go back to the mediation or the NVC stuff. I think um, selecting common ground so that we can channel all that energy in something that is actually serving our, our deeper shared interest. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to, but I'll try to stick around to talk about the platform as well. We can send around an email and talk about the platform or in the platform itself if we succeed to be in everybody. Damiano, okay. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll just conclude. For me, blue is an interesting subject because again, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I think I do personally struggle with the negative aspects of blue, but I do think that um, the, the more expanded is the uh, scope of the service that we do in, in uh, pushed by blue. So the more it's, it's not, you know, egocentric or family centric, -centric the more is wide. And even if it's guided by a sense of guilt at some point of all the guilts to have the guilt to save the whole world is probably not that bad. And it can ultimately be a great sort of segue into, I think, spiritual practices and ultimately awakening in a sense that the Bodhisattva vow that the Tibetans use it is, an extreme form of servitude and even if it's uh, ego I think as egos goes is not not a bad one to to have until the last moment um, I really I really enjoy this call it sort of occurs to me that um, it seems like blue gets like strong reactions in both directions like almost opposites which feels to me like very fitting of blue in of itself you have heaven and you have hell you have good and evil you have um all this kind of stuff in that it like it feels like really um like a really powerful stage to to integrate but also like a really kind of um a triggering and challenging one because the bad in it is really bad and the good in it is really good um so yeah i kind of feel oddly fired up a bit red after after the call and also like trying to <laughs> Uh, soothe myself to sort of tame the red as well. So uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. To me, what this is about recognizing structures, appropriate, even necessary structures. For me, they are largely cognitive, our dogmas, that is our cognitive maps of the universe. We need them, we need some sort of structure or else we're mush and completely ineffectual in our lives and in the world but at the same time staying in balance with it and remembering that our cognitive maps, our structures, our dogmas are just maps. They are relatively true, not absolutely true, which is the mistake we make when we're locked in blue is to think that our cognitive maps are absolute truths. So to hold the structures, but always be open to improving them, to improving our understanding, to changing them radically, but also embracing that need for some structure and for the, the moral, then including for me, the, the moral fiber, I keep coming back to that. So the necessity and appropriateness of healthy structure. Oh, I thought it was a great, you know, I just feel like this is a pretty energetic group, like kind of uh, really got going there into some, um, I, you know, challenging question. People bringing up some challenge, like challenging questions. I appreciated Paul bringing up the challenge of is a shadow even worth talking about or whatever, <laughs> on some level. And then when Heidi said the bit about you Americans, I was like, you people. I was just got. I felt like, oh my god, now I have to say something really integral, and I couldn't even figure out what that was, other than saying we suck, you know. So <laughs> anyway, I thought it was great. I can't wait till we get to logic and science and all that. <laughs> I just wanted to thank uh, Tim for joining us today. And it was wonderful to have you um, and contributing your insights and perspective in the discussion it was really enriching. So thank you, it was wonderful to, to have you here. And, and um, yeah, thank you to everyone. I, this was my favorite one so far. I love red, like uh, this, like people arguing. Like I love, I just love provocative questions and, and that kind of thing. I fully um, agree. I think we need, we need more, like we need more of that.
so I want to, so I was also going to say about that, Paul and I have been talking, I, I floated the idea because I love debate and I want to see what an integral debate looks like. And we need to have that in our society. We need to role model that for the world. And Paul and I were thought about floating an idea called starting another call called integral crossfire, where all we do is debate super controversial issues and do it in a way that's civil and perspectival and understanding and integrating. And I thought about posting on a forum and we just float a bunch of issues we can talk about. People can disagree with each other and just like get that healthy movement of energy in the integral community, which I think that's kind of been the shadow and Frank Visser has kind of hit that, capitalized on that in a degree. So I'd love to see more healthy discussion and debate and also about the, um, uh, what Paul was saying about the shadow, I think that should be an entire column of itself where we just talk about the shadow and problems with shadow, limitations of shadow. So yeah, awesome. You guys are the best. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Ryan, when you do this uh, conversation, make sure that they are recorded and that they are available, that we can, can listen to it. That would be really great. And yeah, shadow, I would still uh, do a little bit, uh, go on with orange and, 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 and you know, go up the, the spiral and keep it in mind. Shadow is a great topic as many others we still have. I mean, if we meet every Sunday, we need some, something to chew on, you know, during the year. So we will have enough uh, topics, I hope so. So thank you. I will stop the recording here. And when we want to talk a little bit about the platform still, or, or otherwise we do it on the... On the um... I'll, I'll just say like two minutes of things, just... Okay, uh, oh, so I leave it on the recording. Yeah, yeah. so uh, again, first of all, thank you for your enthusiasm, for registering. Uh, for me, that's really more of an experiment. Uh, as I mentioned before, that there is a lot of organizations, especially in people that are integral, they don't even label themselves as integral. <laughs> And I am just curious about what can be done to get them to work together. So if, if it were interesting for you at some point, we could have a discussion, not around the platform. For me, the platform is just the one tool that I can make available. If we find another one, great. But for me, the real question is, if we had to begin to get the integral community involved in collaborating proactively in real world things, what would be that process? I think that that's a process that is needed. It's beneficial. And I, since it's my job to provide this kind of thing, I'm inevitably super excited about it. Uh, so my invitation is, uh, you know, I could tell, yeah, just go on the platform, share, post, but that, that's not the really important thing. For me, the really important thing is what would be cool to create as an integral community and then we can together reflect on whether, you know, the technology platform can enable that, whether, you know, Ryan is talking about community activities, even political activities. Uh, I, I think that there is a huge space for that. So the real question is, other than debating, which is still important, as an integral community, what do we want to build together? Uh, I do think integral political party, as long as Ryan, like, actually goes it and tries to be present, and otherwise it's just boring. <laughs> so I, I already vote for Ryan, and uh, so yeah. So that that's basically my my invitation to just think in, in this sense where there are some cool projects to to bring on board and and do cool stuff with. Good. And I had this practical question when I get uh, the email into my inbox that somebody has written a comment. Then I don't know where to find the comment. There is no click. click. No. Yeah, well, no. technically, on the comment itself if you click it should take you there uh if you have do you have outlook are you using outlook no i'm mean, you... using normally chrome or safari no. okay no the, technically on the comment thing you should click worst case sometimes uh, when you get emails browsers don't let you click on things it's a pain uh, so what you do is you just go on the platform and on the top right corner there's a little bell Click on yeah. that bell, you click there, and it will take you right away to where anybody has commented. Yeah, I was wondering because I yeah. tried to click everywhere and no, no, it no, isn't... Top, top right. Top right, you will find it. Again, the, this is like the platform is my child. It's grown out of like a holotropic breathing session I've been working on for many years, but it still could be vastly improved. So I, I just apologize if there are things that are not perfect. I just hope it can help. Yeah, okay. That's also because we, we collaborate also on that. Yeah. Exactly. And I will post the, the calls now on my website, but also in, the, in this section link, link, uh, yeah. after the Zoom calls, something like yeah, yeah. And, like and bring, bring anybody on board that you see 
That's okay. the, only, the only thing that I want to make sure is that we don't make it in a way that the integral forum is no. disrupted or disturbed. So just that's my only goal. And Corey never responded to you? No. Uh, I also wrote him another thing. I think he's just probably getting him in too many messages and stuff like that. Uh, so I don't, it's not a problem, but just a pity not to be able to make these things work together. So you've got that one group about the platform, so you can, so maybe we could put ideas. Yeah, the, the, pro the problem is that there is like, there is even a rule in the community not to link to your own stuff. Oh. Okay. So I, I just don't want to, like, I don't want to start this thing already with a, with a potential conflict because they'd already, I already saw posts in which that happened. So I, I don't really know what, what, what to do about that. So, so um, I, I have a suggestion. invite people, please, Karen. Um, I'm a, I have an ongoing dialogue with Corey on a s related but different issue. Do I have your permission to absolutely, say, hey, absolutely. Corey, you've got, there's this great thing you've it's got to there. check out. Yeah, Go, and it, oh. and it's there and we have, like, for me, the most important thing is that the forum works because we got all this thanks to the forum. So that's priority number one, that, that nothing is, because it sucks when people start to have too many tools. So I don't wanna add to that. But if this is true that in the forum, you shouldn't link to your own stuff, then right. the more is important your platform because you want to have collaboration. So we have to yeah, link exactly. to our I wanna own link to, stuff. I wanna link to, to everybody what else. What are doing, no? Yeah, yeah. So, just so yes, that's please where, Karen. That's where directory is really helpful. Like on our, yes. I do networking, and if you just have somewhere that has a directory, exactly, exactly, or if and you provide that, then he could, or you could provide that. Exactly, guy. and if for any of your projects, for any of your communities, you need that platform, it literally doesn't cost me anything to provide it. It's mm -hmm. there. So let me know, and I'd be happy to make it available. And what you are doing is a directory, no? You are trying to create directories that's, that's for all these things. Thing number that's one so, is a directory, yes. That's so important, yeah. There's like a map and then you click yeah. on the map. And go, yeah. 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 And okay, I just want to say on Corey's behalf that he is overwhelmed with so I, much I stuff. Imagine, I'm sure I you imagine. Can, I'm sure you can all. No, no, no. I, I take no offense. Like, I just write him every once in a while. If he is interested, good. If not, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Tim? Um, I just wanted to say, I'm, I do need to get going now, so I'm going to peel off, but I wanted to thank you all for your warm welcome of me and, um, yeah, for letting me join, and I've really, really enjoyed this. So I hope to make it a, a common practice. Cool. Cheers. Cheers to bye everybody. Bye. See you next bye Sunday. Bye-bye. And bye. Kate, maybe before we can meet. And Ryan, I, I'm actually not joking about you running for office. Me neither. Me neither. Like... <laughs> It's like, I just see it already. Start doing it. I see you in the future. I, I actually, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll I will become American for that and vote for you. <laughs> we need your vote, Heidi. <laughs> I could theoretically. I was married with an American. I could, oh. I probably could. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I have three votes right here. So it means a lot yeah. to me. <laughs> it's a start. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.